Welcome friends. I just want to say a quick thank you to those who have purchased merchandise and tweeted at me wearing said merchandise. The support for the channel and what we do here means more than you can know. It reminds me that while this platform doesn't necessarily deem it valuable, that this community does. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Today's episode of Dark Matters is a tad different. I will be highlighting two unrelated cases from the same state that didn't receive much public attention and have largely been left behind by mainstream media. Thank you in advance for your attention on these cases, and let's get into what matters. In the state of Nevada, two young girls were last seen under a block away from their respective homes when they vanished. In June of 1978, it was 16-year-old Sandra K. Butler, and almost nine years later to the day, in June of 1987, it was 11-year-old Jennifer Lee Martin. Authorities believe both girls possibly met foul play as they've never been seen or heard from again. Though their cases are unconnected, their families both deserve answers. Today on Dark Matters, the disappearances of Sandra Butler and Jennifer Martin. Sparks, Nevada a small suburb of Reno, late June 1978. School was out for the summer, and 16-year-old Sandra K. Butler was looking forward to time off from Reed High School. She and her mother resided in an apartment on 4th and Greenbrae, just across the street from the local bowling alley and shopping center, a gathering site for local kids to briefly escape their parents, and the last place Sandra K. Butler was ever seen. June 26th, 1978. The summer day begins just like any other. Sandra's left to herself after her mother leaves for work. Later, she calls her mother, asking if she can ride her bike to the Reno Rodeo. The rodeo is across town, and Sandra will have to cut through other neighborhoods to get there. Still, Sparks is a safe community. She gives Sandra permission to go and hangs up, not knowing it is the last time she will ever speak to her daughter. The last time anyone sees Sandra, she's walking towards the Greenbrae shopping center across the street from her apartment. Then she vanished. Authorities immediately treated Sandra as a runaway. There were no officers searching for her, canvassing the neighborhood, or interviewing witnesses. There was no media attention, and Sandra's disappearance went largely unnoticed by the public, even though family knew she wouldn't have run away. Eventually, police classified Sandra as a missing person, and her case made its way almost untouched through several rookie detectives in the Sparks Police Department until it came to the desk of Detective Ken Gallup in 2007. Gallup told KOLO 8 News, I have two daughters, and I can't imagine that one of them would go missing, and I would never know what happened to them. I took it personally. But with so little evidence, pursuing any leads proved difficult. However, that didn't stop the authorities from making speculations. In 1978, a married couple was in the Reno area, but they weren't any ordinary couple. Gerald Gallego and Charlene Williams kidnapped multiple people, mostly teenage girls, who were sexually assaulted before being executed. Their victims were mainly from Sacramento, California, but they also deviated to Oregon and Nevada. Here are their 10 known victims. Rhonda Scheffler, Kippy Vaught, Stacy Redekin, Karen Chipman Twiggs, Linda Aguilar, Virginia Moschel, Craig Miller and Mary Sowers, Brenda Judd and Sandra K. Colley. Brenda Judd and Sandra Colley were abducted from the Reno, Nevada fairgrounds by the couple on June 24, 1979, 
a year after Sandra Butler vanished. Authorities say the couple was in the area when Sandra disappeared. In 1983, the Gallegos' horrific crimes played out in a courtroom, with Charlene turned witness for the prosecution in exchange for a reduced sentence, claiming she had no part in the murders and that she tried to stop Gerald. Many people still believe she willingly participated in the acts, despite her claims. Eventually, Gerald was sentenced to death in California for the murders, but died of rectal cancer in 2002 before his execution. Charlene served out her sentence and was released in 1997, and as of 2016, was living in California under a new name. Though Detective Gallup hasn't had the opportunity to interview Charlene, the possibility remains that Sandra Butler could have been one of the Gallegos' victims. However, because so little is known, other possibilities can't be discounted. WebSleuth user Kate F1029 recently proposed that Sandra resembles a Jane Doe from Florida. Jane Doe was struck by a tractor trailer on I-95 close to the Fort Lauderdale airport on August 3, 1982, and died as a result. But her identity remains a mystery. There are some key differences. Doe was estimated to be between 14 and 17 years old, while in 1982, Sandra would have been 20. Doe had no scars, markings, or tattoos to help authorities identify her, and she was found wearing jeans, a dark blue blouse, and sandals. She was also said to have a distinct accent, either Southern or Cajun, and she chewed her nails. Detectives investigation led them to the possibility that she'd hitchhiked across the country, stopping in Oklahoma City, Canutillo, Texas, and West Monroe, Louisiana. They thought she also had family or friends in Las Vegas, Nevada, and possibly used the name Donna while traveling. Her appearance vaguely resembles Sandra's, brown eyes with light brown hair, five feet two inches tall, close to Sandra's height, and she also weighed 110 pounds. Despite the similarities, it's unknown if authorities have ever investigated and ruled out Jane Doe in Florida. Answers still have yet to surface for detectives and family. Detective Gallup updated Sandra's dental records and entered her family's DNA into the national database for future comparisons. However, he knows the best chance for closure is a witness, someone who may have known Sandra or saw her that day in 1978. Gallup said, It is our obligation, not only as a police department, but as a community, to get some answers for this family. They don't know what happened to their daughter. As of 2016, Gallup was still working on Sandra's case. Sandra K. Butler was 16 years old at the time of her disappearance, went by the nickname Sandy, and age progressions show her at age 40, 45, and 50 years old. She is a Caucasian female with light brown or blonde hair, brown eyes with a freckled complexion, and pierced ears. Her second toes were noticeably longer than her big toes. At the time, she was approximately 5 feet tall and weighed 110 pounds. Dental records are available for comparison. If you have any information on the circumstances surrounding Sandra K. Butler's disappearance, please contact the Sparks Police Department at 775-353-2231, or you can contact Ken Gallup at the department at 775-353-2231. 2241, or you can leave an anonymous tip with Secret Witness at 775 322 4900. Reno, Nevada, June 1987. 11 year old freckled Jennifer Lee Martin lived in a Lemon Valley mobile home with her family. To pay the bills, her mother worked as a maid, her father as a porter, while Jennifer attended Lemon Valley Elementary. Her 20-year-old brother, Charles II, recently left the army and began a family with his wife, Lily. 
Their 21-month-old child, Crystal Lynn, was the apple of Jennifer's eye. The young aunt doted on her niece, but wasn't as forthcoming to those outside the family. Independent and quiet, but not shy, Jennifer wasn't afraid to confront adults, immensely distrusted strangers, and refused to be pushed around. She was also cautious of her own safety, fearful to walk home from a next-door neighbor's at night and phoning if she was ever late for any reason. She occasionally rode the bus alone into the city to visit her mother, but preferred to keep close to home and had no history of running away. A regular face at the local 7-Eleven, Jennifer made the five-minute walk from her home to the store up to three times a day. She was settling into her new neighborhood just fine, and though she'd moved from Clearwater, Florida 10 months prior, she showed no sign that she missed her previous home. Then the Martins' peaceful new life shattered. Sunday, June 28, 1987. After Charles drives his father to work, he asks Jennifer to run to 7-Eleven for a six-pack of Coke, giving her enough money to buy a candy bar as a reward. Around 3 p.m., a barefoot Jennifer enters the nearly empty store. The only other people are the clerk behind the register and a man asking for directions. Jennifer pays for the Coke and candy and leaves without uttering a word to anyone. The clerk watches her make a left towards her mobile home on Surge Street. No one else was near the young girl. Fifteen minutes later, Charles realizes his sister hasn't returned. Thinking something held her up, he walks to the 7-Eleven but finds no trace of Jennifer, either inside the store or along the way. In the span of just a few hundred feet, Jennifer has vanished. Unlike Sandra, authorities immediately suspect something more sinister than a runaway child. That evening, local law enforcement set up command close to the Martin home. Neighbors and locals aided in canvassing the Lemon Valley neighborhoods. The number of people searching clogged traffic along the street, but when there was no trace of Jennifer, authorities took more extreme measures. Monday, authorities scour North Valley and Lemon Valley with ground and air searches. They question the store clerk and the man asking for directions in the 7-Eleven, but gain no traction in the investigation. With a lack of a crime scene or a suspect, authorities classify her case as a missing person instead of an abduction. Twelve days pass, and though police submit Jennifer to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and follow leads concerning a sex offender near the 7-Eleven around the time she disappeared, and a reported grave, they come away empty-handed. After reports of a white pickup and a light-colored Toyota Corolla surface, authorities eliminate the driver of the pickup as a suspect and are unable to track down the Corolla. It's unknown if the car is even involved. Secret Witness offers $2,500 for information concerning Jennifer's disappearance, but the wait and lack of answers is agonizing for family. No one in Jennifer's family thought their beloved girl had just run away from home. Jennifer was happily anticipating another niece or nephew on the way, in addition to adoring her current niece, Crystal. Her father agreed that his daughter wouldn't have run away. She didn't take anything with her, including shoes, and told a friend to call her at home later that day. A phone call she missed. With the aid of a local printer, Jennifer's family created 1,200 bumper stickers displaying her picture, hoping it might jog someone's memory of that day. But none of the bumper stickers, posters, volunteers, police interviews, or tips came to fruition. There was a brief glimmer of hope when an Arizona shelter for runaways reported a girl who resembled Jennifer in their building. However, the Martins learned upon arrival, it wasn't their beloved daughter. Jennifer was still missing. For Colleen Martin, not knowing what happened to her sister or where she is, is a daily struggle. She told KOLO 8 News, 
There's not a day goes by I don't think of her many times. Colleen keeps the family phone number, hopeful Jennifer might call, but also awaiting closure to find some semblance of peace. The lack of answers is frustrating. While authorities suspect foul play, they have no strong suspects, but as of 2015, we're still actively investigating leads. The one thing that might bring answers is a memory. Jennifer Lee Martin was 11 years old when she disappeared. Standing at 4 feet 6 inches tall, with shoulder-length brown hair, she weighed 49 pounds. She was last seen wearing a gray-purple sweatshirt dress and was barefoot. She has blue eyes, freckles, a star-shaped scar on the inside of her upper right arm, as well as two small hairline scars under her chin. Other distinguishing marks include pierced ears, several white bumps on her back, and a birthmark resembling a coffee stain on her right hip. Her case is now classified as a non-family abduction. If you have any information concerning Jennifer's disappearance, please contact the Washa County Sheriff's Office at 775-328-3001 or 775-328-3369. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel. Whether they are passionate about cases like Sandra's or Jennifer's or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, a big thank you from me. Thank you for giving both Sandra Butler's and Jennifer Martin's case a moment of your time, and my heart goes out to both of their families and friends. They've gone too long without answers, and we all hope closure can begin soon. And no matter what you choose to speculate or what you believe, I ask you only for respect in the comments below for both the girls and their families. And remember, though these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. Thank you for watching the video. Exposure to these cases is highly important. And thank you all again who support. If you're looking to buy merch or join the Patreon family, info is in the description as always. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night.